Hey everybody, welcome to the Gospel Lifeline, uh, another episode for the podcast here today. I'm I'm Robert Kale, and I am here with Matthew Statler, and I'm Neil Grogan, and we got an exciting episode today, part two to our anxious uh, or our anxiety podcast series. Um, part one we called "Anxious Hearts Fear False Gods," so I think that. It's only appropriate, maybe, that we title uh, this week this week's episode "Righteous Hearts Fear the One True God," and uh, kind of we want what we want to do today is give a response to uh, or solutions to the problems we exposed and thought through in the first podcast of the series. Um, does that sound good with you guys? Oh yeah, yeah. Remember, awesome. we we gave you an assignment last podcast, and that was to. Um, record whether or not what is it that you feel like you're losing or not getting what's causing that anxiety and so you should have a some kind of idea as to what is going on underneath now that fear that anxiety that you have but Neil has some really good stuff that um, I'm looking forward to hearing yeah I think uh, you know to explain the approach right because um, we don't believe there's such a thing as a magic pill or a a potion <laughs> that you can you can tank just to solve these anxious issues, but everything starts at the the heart, right? And so, um, for Robert, Matt, and I, we take a biblical approach and uh, provide biblical solutions to these heart issues, and we kind of get this from Second Timothy chapter three, uh, where we learn what Scripture is good for and uh, who who's the author of Scripture. And 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 16, says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so the, the response or the approach or the solution that we work through today will all be biblically based. And the reason for that is how we understand the heart. The Bible would teach the heart that is dynamic, that the heart is kind of made up of three parts three kind of components, biblically speaking. It's uh, made up to of our wills, or our behaviors, our, vo- our volition, right? Um, it's made up of our affections and desires. And lastly, our uh, beliefs, thoughts, our cognition. And so with that, we can look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 here and see how the Bible is good to answer these questions of the, pro- the heart. It says first that the that scripture is profitable for teaching. What it does is it corrects our false beliefs, our false thoughts, where we are misunderstanding who God is and misunderstanding who, who we are. When we look at scripture, what it does is it it tells us, it teaches us exactly who God is and who we are in light in light of Him. Second, uh, for our desires we see the word scripture is is profitable for correction and repute reproof um with our desires where we have desires that are uh contrary to god or or the things of god or uh, sinful desires and sinful aims what we see here is that the bible is equipped to uh correct and charge us with what and expose what's wrong in those desires. And lastly, for training in righteousness, right? It teaches us how to exert right behaviors. If we have had sinful behaviors in the past or or commonly, what we see in scripture is is directions for what what it looks like to be righteous and what it looks like to uh, walk in righteousness with Christ according to what scripture teaches. So for what purpose, right? And this is the essence of this podcast that we would be equipped for every good work and lack nothing because scripture provides for us the solutions to these very big problems we have. And, and the very big problem that we're going to discuss today again is, is anxiety. And so we want to see how scripture provides the appropriate solutions, how the gospel provides the appropriate solution to these big matters of the heart. So often um, it, you'll hear people throw a Bible verse at you, right? And it could probably fit on a in a coffee mug. And you say, you know, my problems are bigger than a coffee mug's worth of statements. And so when we when we read scripture, we real we really do read it with a a whole 
holistic worldview. We don't just take a verse here and a verse there and said and say take this and call us in the morning like as some kind of prescription. Um, so last week we talked about fear and how anxiety is a subspecies of fear, and that there were four kind of main ways that we can identify this fear that we're that we're dealing with. And so there were guilty conscience, wrong values, unbelief, or idols. And so we're going to go through and start talking about different ways to address those underlying problems of the heart. And so the first one is guilty conscience. Neil, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so just to kind of cover the guilty conscience aspect one more time, you know, we see that... um, one of the reasons that people are so dominated by fear is because they're in sin and because they're in sin, their conscience is weighing them down. They're guilty of something, right? We saw Adam in Genesis chapter three, um, sow fig leaves and hide from God, right? He's trying, he, he knows there's sin in him and he's hiding from God because there's guilt to his sin. And so, you know, how, how do we respond? So you may, be listening right now with with a guilty conscience with sin that's crippling that you're afraid if it comes into light then it's going to break everything around you and i want to be the first to say man like we hear that and uh man we grieve over your sin with you but you need to understand that man your sin and the sorrow that it's producing in you um and it's good if it's godly sorrow <clears throat> But if your fear is consumed by how the world will view you uh, after this, um, what what you will learn is um, that you'll continue to walk back into sin. And so um, godly sorrow should produce in us repentance and faith and salvation. And so when we understand our sin, it's before you, right? Um, you, you see it, man. Maybe you uh, cheated on your spouse or... Uh, lusted after whatever, or uh, were unethical in the workplace, or your sin before you is that you're, you're so consumed with what other people will think of you and you feel the guilt of that. What do you do? Well, the Bible would tell you, well, Christ himself would tell you uh, to draw near to him. In Matthew 11, 28 and 30, Jesus says um, to the person with guilt, that's all consuming. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What guilt will do is it will feel like you are drowning in the ocean and there is nothing you can do to save yourself. There's no one who can help you. And the only one who can take that guilt from you And put it on the cross, just Christ himself. And that's why he says, take up my yoke. Put my yoke on you. It's not a yoke that will push you down deeper into the water, but it's one that is buoyant, that will bring you up and it will save you and refresh your soul. Only I, the Lord Jesus Christ, can give you peace for those who are weary and heavy laden. And man, guilt causes weariness. And that weariness, in this case, from uh, the direction we're taking is a is a fruit of fear, misplaced fear. Oh, Pastor Matt's getting a phone call. It's a uh, it's a fruit of misplaced fear, fearing a false god. And so, you know, what do you do with that, man? You draw near to the throne room of grace that Hebrews four talks about to receive grace and mercy to help in your time of need. And so, man, the solution for a guilty conscience is the cross of Jesus Christ. One of the, one of the things we talk about is how our faith has a mechanism to deal with a lot of these underlying problems. And we, we're not trying to dunk on the secular methods and we're not trying to to beat up anybody who um, follows those kind of paths. But what we see is that there's not a way to deal with a guilty conscience in a secular system. They can tell you to forget about it. They could try to medicate you. They could even tell you to go and say sorry. But ultimately, our guilt is before a holy and perfect God. And so when we go to that God, we have that solution. 
Our next area is wrong values. It's, it's loving something um, to excess. It's valuing or hoping in something else. And, and the Puritans, they wrote a lot about this kind of stuff. And they have a truth that they always put like with 15 other words, right? So the truth is that there's a expulsive power of a new affection. And I'm going to flesh more again. Say it one more again. <laughs> expulsive power of a new affection. And basically what that means is that a new affection, a better affection can push out a lesser or worser affection. And they would say it with nicer words than me. Um, it comes from first John chapter one or sorry, chapter two, verse 15. And it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. And so what this Puritan has done is he has taken it and taken this idea of how do you remove something that is an idol in your heart? And so he gives us an example. Um, If I was to give you all these beakers that are empty and I say, I want you to get the air out of that beaker. And I give you all the, the scientific equipment to do it. I give you every, a full-on laboratory full of equipment. How would you remove the air from that beaker? And so you could try all these different methods. You could use like a suction cup. You could try to um, create a vacuum of some kind. But he says, why don't you just pour water into that? And what you've done is you've pushed the air out with that water. So the water is the expulsive power of that new affection. Um, I like to talk to youth and I say, you know, how do you know that you could turn off your lust like a light switch? And they'll look at me and say, no, that's not possible. I said, let me give you a scenario. Let's say that you're at home and you have a girl over, you're, you're breaking the rules at your house and things are going downhill fast. You're kind of going to the point of no return. Um, you're moving beyond where you should go um, intimately. And I said, do you know you can turn off that lust in that moment? And they'll say, no, that's not possible. And I say, well, okay. What happens when her dad, an army ranger who just returned from Afghanistan on a uh, six-month deployment, walks in that front door? I said, that that desire for life has now pushed out your desire for that woman. You have a new affection that has pushed out the other one. And so when we when we look at Christ, that is that new affection that pushes out the old affection. And so how do we get rid of these lesser idols that are these lesser values in our life? So when money becomes so important in your life, you need to start thinking about eternity. What will it look like to be a rich person in eternity? You're going to look like everybody else. What's going to happen when you go before a holy and perfect God with your collection of seashells, as John Piper would would explain? And um, the, the desiring God concept of God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And so building on that concept is how can you replace those lesser idols, those lesser values by pursuing God. And so we remember how we talked about wrong values can cause you anxiety. And so if my, my, my idol is comfort and I'm on my way home and I'm anticipating comfort and I start getting anxiety thinking about, Oh my, I have four kids at home. I'm not going to get any peace and quiet. And my anxiety levels raise and I walk in that door, I'm going to treat my family poorly. And that's, that's my, greater love right now is my own comfort. But if I approach the house with the idea of I am going to love my family because that's what's of eternal value, I will have a much better demeanor in my approach to my family. And so that's what you get or a way for you to remove those those other values. Um, Jesus says it very well when he says, or he says it perfectly. He says it perfectly when he says, (laughs) Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If your treasure is on this earth, that's where your heart's going to be. If your treasure is in heaven, that's where your heart's going to be. And so that's what you need to start doing is finding ways to use the expulsive power of a new affection to push out that old nasty one. So we've talked about guilty conscience, wrong values, and now we're leaning into unbelief or lack of trust. Um, And there's also a a physical component, right, Neil? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, You know, one of the the most important things that we understand 
that the Bible teaches is that we're made up of two parts, if you will. There's an inner and there's an outer man or woman, right? Human. Uh, and so what I've found uh, with anxiety is is we'll, we'll come into conflict with a circumstance or, or adversity, if you will, that causes in us extreme anxiety, right? There's this fear we have about that circumstance and what if could happen. Uh, and then one of the the fueling factors that um, perpetuates that fear is things like lack of sleep or, you know, poor diet or, um, you know, you name it. You Maybe you respond like we talked about last week to adversity with alcohol or drugs or uh, buying a bunch of stuff or eating little Debbie snack cakes. Y'all little Debbie's a little monster. I'll tell you what <laughs> it'll get you. But, uh, but that's an aspect of the outer man that we, we have to look at. And I think a good example of this and specifically fear we see in first Kings 19, basically what's, what's occurred is uh, there's been this severe drought in the land and King Ahab who's married to this woman named Jezebel has all these prophets of Baal, right? And uh, they're trying to bring down water and the prophet Elijah, he challenges them to, you know, whose God is real kind of test. And essentially long story short, Elijah pours water on all of these, uh, you know, things of wood that are supposed to catch fire. And so it shouldn't catch fire because it's covered in water. And God sends down fire, encompasses everything. Then he sends down fire and burns all the false prophets. And uh, man, Elijah has seen the might and the sheer power of God. And it makes Jezebel mad. And Jezebel says, I'm going to kill Elijah. And she threatens him. And man, Elijah doesn't respond very well to this adversity. He takes off even after seeing the power of God. Um, where it should be good evidence for having a right place fear in God. He takes off and he runs, man. He's, he's, <laughs> he's tired. There's been uh, n- sleepless nights that we see in the text. And in first Kings chapter 19, he finally gets to this place where the Lord uh, is, sp- is speaking to him. But before he does so, it says the Lord puts him to sleep. He gives him a nap. He takes God takes care of the outer man and then speaks truth to the inner man, inner man here. And so um, there's this physical component that we we have to consider. You know, you might be um, struggling with something like postpartum uh, depression. Right. And very quickly, a medical professional is going to give you medicine and and put you on a regiment. And I'm not saying those things are inherently wrong or, or wicked or by any means, but you know, one of the big um, components is women dealing with postpartum aren't getting any sleep. And so, you know, what, when we assess the situation we're in, we need to assess it holistically. Like Matt said, first and foremost, well, what does sleep look like right now for you? What rhythms have you built in? What breaks have you built in? Because what happens when you're dealing with all this, this hormonal flush is you've got lack of sleep. <laughs> now you're anxious about whether or not you're taking care of your baby. Maybe breastfeeding's not going very well. So you're anxious about whether or not you're being a good mom or a bad mom or or you're lacking in something. Well, maybe the fear now is that you're losing your mind and you're going crazy. And man, it's just, it's encompassing you. And now you're snapping and, and you're frustrated. And, 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 you know, I even had a friend that I, I, uh, well, I was really good friends with her husband. Um, but she was an acquaintance of mine who ended up going into a, a manic episode out of postpartum and, and died. And, but one of the things that she was dealing with, she hadn't slept in forever and my wife struggled with postpartum, you know, and, and it, man, if I had any encouragement, this is a sidebar, but if I had any encouragement to a husband it's to pay attention to your bride, man, 
really don't just say I can't do nothing about feeding a baby. She has to do everything. You need to be watching over her, uh, ensuring that she is she is treated on the out the outer side as well. Um, because when we have these fear uh, snares that we're struggling with, um, and then you add in these circumstances that are affecting us physically, man, it just creates this concoction of uh, despair and and sin. And so, you know, that's one aspect. Robert, uh, going further with the issue of unbelief and fear. Um, Real quick, be- before we go to yeah. Robert, I just I wanted to mention something about the importance of the church in that scenario, Neil. Mm. Um, oh, yeah, The totally. church is here for that purpose, to bear each other's burdens, right? I know there are single moms out there who don't have a husband that can help them with the postpartum depression type stuff. Call your pastor and ask him if there's anybody that could possibly just come over, watch the baby for a few hours so you can get a nap. There is nothing yeah. wrong with that. Um, don't be afraid to be weak with the body of Christ. Um, same thing with with adoption stuff. If you need a rest, that's not saying you're a bad adopter. You, you need the rest. And, and so... Yeah. Don't hesitate. And the wife, ask your husband for some help and and, and stir him up to do his duty as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, the church is so important for these kind of problems, for anxiety. Um, the church should be happy to step in and support you. So a fear of man in this case would keep us from reaching out for help um, and would keep us in bondage longer, right? Um, So going back to the original thought there, uh, Robert, can you tease out for us more of a biblical solution to the issue of unbelief um, that we see uh, as evidence of a a heart that fears false gods? Yeah, so last week we talked about the fourth area, right? We talked about it being idols. And so I think that, you know, when people have a wrong belief in the wrong thing or the wrong person, the wrong system that they can place their hope and trust in that. And it causes anxiety. And so kind of what I want to do is, is I want to walk out uh, a passage in scripture. That's pretty, pretty common. Um, and it's found in Philippians chapter four, starting in verse six and working through nine. And I'll just read it real quick. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse eight. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And then verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I think if you were to break that down, kind of go back to the beginning of this this week's uh podcast where Neil broke down 2 Timothy 3.16. What do we see that scripture is teaching us um, here about anxiety? Well, it's teaching me not to be anxious. And I know that sounds super silly and like, well, yeah, thanks, Robert, for, you know, just throwing out there not to be anxious when my world is upside down because fill in the blank. Well, I understand that, but we're answering these questions from a biblical perspective. And the Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. And then my favorite three letter word in the Bible, but right. And then, so what's the, what's the kind of the reproof or the rebuke? What are we doing wrong? Well, we're being anxious. We're, we're fearing things that we can't control. We're, we're getting all worked up about the things that we have no power over. Absolutely zero. We have false hopes and false beliefs put in things and it's, it's wrecking us. And so how do you fix that? How do you correct that? Well, instead of being anxious, we, Take everything to God in prayer and supp- uh, for supplication and thanksgiving and make our requests known to him, right? Uh, in First Peter uh, 5, 7, it says, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And cares is another word for anxiety. It's casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And then we see what happens when we correct that anxiety and we take our anxiety to God, we see that we receive the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding and it guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So when we have our, our, our 
our uh, desires and our affections and our trust and our hopes put in on God and in Christ, we get peace because it's in the right place. And that peace is helping us stay with a mind that's focused on Christ and our hearts that are focused on Christ and doing what we need to be doing in our own humanness to be as Christ-like as possible. And then in verse eight, we see that, you know, this is the kind of the training and righteousness part where we see, okay, well, how can I do this? How can I put this into play? How do I keep my mind there? And I have this peace and this peace is protecting me. Well, we, we start to focus on what's true, what's honorable, what's just in the verse, you know, it goes on and, and it talks about, um, you know, think about these things instead of what thinking about the things that we can't control, thinking about, what my kids ate this morning and what it's going to do to their bodies. And then if they get sick, then the people are going to think I'm a bad mom or thinking about um, my report that I turned in last week at work. And now is it messed up? And then if it's messed up, then they're not going to want me on the team and I'm going to get fired and I'm not going to have money. I'm not going to have a house. It can quickly unravel. And then in the last part, we say, this is kind of the action, right? It's a call to action. Paul says what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things, do it. And I I want to take us all the way back to the beginning of this passage. And this is something I like to point out guys, just like Neil said, in your anxiety, in your fear, in your mess that you're in right now, the end of verse five says in this, in the ESV, it says, the Lord is at hand. Some versions say the Lord is near. And then it goes into, don't be anxious about anything, right? So it's real easy to get caught up in, well, the beginning of the verse says, don't be anxious about anything. Well, that's not going to help. Bible slam shut, goes back on the shelf. No, read the whole passage, right? At the end of verse five, that sentence starts out with, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is close by. Don't be anxious for anything. So even in your anxious moments, in your anxiety, the Lord is still there with you. And then as we see that, and we go through the rest of that passage, then we can put it into play. Mm. And so if we looked at verse eight and we see that we're supposed to focus on what's true, what's honorable, what's just, and so on, let, let's uh, let's just take a few questions and ask some questions. How do we find out what we're thinking about? And uh, I have a resource that I got picked up. It's called um, Questions on the Heart by Julie Ganchow, uh, subtitle, Effective Question Asking for Growing Communicators. And some of the questions about anxiety that she has in there are really good ones. And one of them is, are you thinking about things that are true and real or things that are imagined? Mm. So think about this. I mean, Neil is a parent, right? Or a pastor. You could go up there and you could preach the best sermon ever. And what are some of the negative thoughts that might come into your head or some of the positive thoughts that you think are good, but are not? Yeah. Uh, did anybody even get anything I just said? <laughs> uh, as if in my communication skills, somehow that can transform a heart, right? Or they come back and they, you know, they uh, compliment you in big ways. And you're like, man, I did that. That was all me, you know, equally sinful, right? Uh, probably worse because now you're glory thieving. Um which, you know, is an aspect of fear of man, because then you begin to preach concerned about that instead of concerned about giving glory to God in your preaching. Uh, but as a parent, too, you know, on the, in the same way, when, when my kids do the right thing, people begin to look at you in a certain manner, right? Look at, man, Neil's kids are good. You know, they're smart, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is a reflection of who? Well, Neil. And, and not mm-hmm. God who wove them together in their mother's womb, you know, who gave them their gifts and their talents. And, and, uh, you know, yeah, it's my job to train them, but he does the work in them. Yeah. And, and, and I think too, that in whatever we do and, and what we're thinking about, is it real or is it imagined mm-hmm. it, that we need to know that. We have to be able to tell ourselves, no, okay, this is me taking me down this path because I want fill in the blank, right? I want people to tell me that I, that was the best sermon they ever heard. And if they don't, then I'm going to feel unappreciated. Mm-hmm. Um, I want people to think my kids are the best behaved kids ever because then I'm the best parent. 
And so, Matt, another thing, too, that some more questions in here, and I'll read them real quick. Just like, have you stopped thinking about God and his sovereign control over the situation? What are you thinking about instead of God and his sovereign control over the situation? And will thinking anxious thoughts help or hurt your ability to handle the real issues going on? And so, you know, just kind of quickly going back to that unbelief or that trust, if we don't believe and trust in God's sovereignty and God's grace and God's mercies, how can that cause us to become more anxious? And then again, if we are listening to scripture and we're listening to what our belief system tells us, it will reveal the idols in our hearts. But if not, then we start to continue to worship those false idols and move further away from what God has for us. Yeah. So Robert, what do really, we do? Well, Robert, I really like how you're bringing out the actual experiential aspect of this um, in mm-hmm. Philippians four that you were reading from the the word that that talks about learned and in verse eleven of four it says, "I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself." What what Paul is t- is teaching us is that this is a learned behavior. Asking these questions is learned. You're not going to wake up as a brand new Christian and have all these solutions floating around in your mind, but you will learn through circumstances how to deal with it. And that's why these questions are so important, right? What are these idols that are growing up in my heart? We're going to always be killing idols in our heart. This is a, a continual thing. Neil? Yeah, I, it- you know, to set up the last piece of this podcast today, I just I want to draw our attention to Matthew 6. And when Christ, you know, addresses anxious people, worry, worrisome people. And, uh, you know, he, he highlights, man, how the Lord is sovereign and takes care of us. And and then asks this question toward, towards the end, I think around verse 29. And he says, you know, uh, why do you worry about tomorrow? Let you know, tomorrow worry about itself. Um, don't don't get sucked into imagination land, you know. But what do you do? Seek first the kingdom of heaven. That's how he closes it down. Seek the kingdom of heaven. So all that to say, hearts are exposed. Man, there's fear. There's misplaced fear that maybe maybe he's been revealed to us through these questions or through the challenge, doing some self-talk logs, whatever it is. Matt, what do we do about it after we see it? With, with like uh, David says in Psalm 51, you know, my iniquity is before me. I'm conscious of my rebellion. Now what? That's right. So so once we, we get to the point of identifying it and knowing is kind of half the battle in many ways, we know what's wrong with us. We know what's at the source. We got to confess it. And confession is really the chemotherapy that's killing off that unbelief in our hearts. And so we have this um, confession and repentance, and we need to um, use really wild measures, um, like like amputation is kind of how Jesus talks about it, right? We poke out our eyeball if we're sinning visually, if we, we cut off our hand. And so we have to confess at the source what is the problem? So if my idol is comfort, I need to confess that to God that I want comfort more than I want to do his will. And uh, a helpful acronym that I use uh, with a lot of my guys and I use personally all the time when I was in the throes of being a, a drunk, I would typically drive by a gas station and want to stop and grab um, a bottle especially in, in states that have um, free access to hard liquor. And so as, as I drive by, typically I would think, oh, man, I need to go pick up a Coke. And I, then I, you know, I park and I walk in and I grab myself a bottle of all these types of alcohol. And, uh, or, yeah, my family needs milk, right? There's any, any possible option that I would use to get in there and get that thing. And so when that thought crosses my mind, I need to confess it immediately. So I use this acronym. Um, I, I borrowed this from Heath Lambert. And it's um, CAR, C-A-R, confess, accept, and request. Mm. 
And so I confess the thought like, Lord, I want to drink and I know that's sinful for me right now because I will take it beyond the natural bounds that I need to. I will, I will take it to drunkenness. I know I, I know myself. And so I confess that. And if there's a uh, maybe there's a fear of man involved in there, I'm going to a party and I want to be confident and secure. So I'm going to drink just to get ready for it. So I confess that. Then I accept the free gift of forgiveness. First John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess, he will forgive us. But not only that, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's the key, right? I don't want to just have to confess every t- 10 steps. I want to be cleansed of all unrighteousness. And so I request, C-A-R, yeah, I get in my car and I drive away from temptation. C-A-R, confess, accept, and request Christ's help. And so I go to the throne of God and I beg for mercy. I beg for help in fighting these future temptations. And we know that this is a learned behavior. This is not something that happens. So maybe as I'm driving by the gas station, I get to the to the parking lot and then I turn around. And maybe next time I just I just drive by instead of actually going in. And it's a progressive change in my life. It's not an immediate um, change and that's how we that's how we determine success is how quick am I to go to confession or how long do I come up with excuses for my behavior like oh I went through a hard life by being in the war so therefore I should be allowed to drink and cuss at little kids or whatever excuse that we make for our sinfulness uh, Neil you had something yeah so you said the car acronym is confess accept request and you know, I might add one more, you know, I like improving already. Yeah. Well, well done things. I would add another R replace. That's um, right. So, That's absolutely yeah, right. Because it, when we're thinking about the issue of fear and misplaced fear, well, okay, we've confessed the idol of maybe it's glory or, or the sin of, of, of glory for yourself instead of for God. You confess the, the, uh, the fear of things you cannot control uh, that you're trying to control or, or whatever, right? You've confessed it. You've accepted the forgiveness as you've, as you've asked God to forgive you and you've asked him for help so that you can identify and deal with and, and progress over time. But what also should you do is you should be replacing that misplaced fear with righteous placed fear. And so, um, the Bible would say there is only one appropriate place to fear, and that is to fear the Lord your God. And right. the reason the reason why we fear him is because we actually understand his holiness or we we can actually conceptualize it. Maybe we I don't think on this side of glory we'll ever be able to get the whole extent of it, but we understand his holiness, his power the the full reality the full scope of God as he's revealed himself to us in his word and when we understand who God is and what he requires of us there is only one place that it should drive us and that is to him not away from him but it's to him because he alone to your point earlier Matt can cleanse you of all unrighteousness and so you know just to land the plane here a righteous heart fears the one true God. They do not fear these things that cannot rescue you that are worthless and will only, you know, keep you in bondage. And so, man, we, we just want to challenge you to confess those sins before you're, you know, before Christ, uh, whether he's your savior or not, he's the only one who can forgive you of your sins, um, to confess your sins to him, to ex, uh, accept, the forgiveness that he can only uh, provide request the help that he can only give as you progress towards more righteous behaviors, as you are trained in righteousness, like second Timothy three uh, 17 says, or 16 says rather. And lastly, replace that wrong place fear with a, with a right place fear of God. Guys, that's another episode of the Gospel Lifeline podcast. We thank you for listening. And man, if you have any questions or thoughts or concerns about this issue, feel free to, you know, hit us uh, up in our social media page, uh, facebook.com slash the Gospel Lifeline. And uh, man, we'd love to 
you know, chat with you guys, message us, feel free. Also, it would be super helpful if you subscribe on whatever podcast platform you listen to and give us an honest five-star review. Smash that like button and all those other cool catchphrases that the kids use today. All right, guys. Thanks again. Peace. Peace.